Amid the FTX debacle and chaos in crypto trading this week, one fact has stood out. Bitcoin futures ETFs, including the largest, the ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF, BITO is the symbol, saw record trading volume, operated smoothly, and it operated in a regulated market. That's the futures market. Let's talk to the man in charge of that ETF. Simeon Hyman is ProShares global investment strategist. Also joining us, Deborah Fior, founder and managing partner of ETF, ETFG and one of the world's foremost ETF authorities. Simeon, uh, lack of regulation over FTX is just driving everybody crazy at this point. But we did have one thing that really stood out to me. We have an, an entity that traded Bitcoin, Bitcoin futures, in the futures market, record volume. This is your product, operated efficiently. The prices collapsed, but if you wanted to get in or out at any one time, you were able to do that. Absolutely. So we have BITO, which is the long Bitcoin strategy ETF using Bitcoin futures. We also have BITI on the short side. Both saw tons of volume. Both traded well. Spreads, t uh, spreads tight in a tumultuous market. Yeah. And uh, you know what's amazing to me, um, uh, Deborah, is Regardless of the debate on what crypto assets are worth, and some people argue they're not worth anything, and this is a stunning collapse, the ETF market functioned fine here. Another example of really high stress, and the ETF market functioned as it was supposed to. Yeah, and that's not surprising, because think back to the time of COVID and high volatility. People thought fixed income ETFs weren't going to work, and they did, right? So the ETF wrapper works really well. And why does it work so well? What makes it so... Efficient, you know, like people say that about the bond market, you know, it, well, oh, what, you have these specialty bond offerings, you know, uh, you know, bond, uh, any, any kind of uh, bank notes, for example, or um, various offerings of uh, limited bond trades that were available. And the minute the market gets panicky, the underlyings are not going to be able to trade and the ETF will freeze up. And it turns out that wasn't true. None of that is true. Right. Actually, the, the ETF was the price leader over the underlying. That seems to be the, uh, the, the real brilliant insight here that we've gained from the ETF business. So I think it goes back to there is a whole ecosystem and ETFs are highly regulated, right? They're funds that have the added benefit of being listed and traded on exchange. So what's inside of it is highly regulated. And then the authorized participants, the market makers, the trading desks all work together to make sure they work. Yeah. And they go out and find prices. So that's what happened during the fixed income volatility during COVID. The APs go out and find real-time prices to be able to trade. And that's why ETFs were more efficient in pricing than mutual yeah. funds. Yeah. And remember also, you, 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 in a lot of cases, you're not trading the underlying. You're just trading the, the ETF as a product. That's exactly. an important way to look at it. So there was enormous pressure on the SEC and on Gensler, Gary Gensler, and on his predecessors to approve a Bitcoin ETF. He has not been willing to do that. He has said there are aspects of this that are unregulated still, uh, particularly the exchanges. There are this fraud and corruption charges out there. He's looking pretty good right now, at least in my opinion. I mean, there, he, he, he's stalling. It looks like it was the right thing to do at this point. Um, what does it do for the chances of a Bitcoin ETF sometime in the future? And what, what have we learned about this? Well, I think it is important, though, to look outside the U.S. So in Canada, we have Spot, Bitcoin, yeah. we have Ethereum, we have Ether. We have a bunch of products in Europe, in Brazil and other markets, and they've all worked well. Right. Yeah. So I do think that the crypto market has moved on from the initial time back in 2013 when the twins wanted to launch yeah. a Bitcoin product. Right. Yeah. So I think that. It probably would have worked well, but I think right now there's not an appetite to bring it forward. And I don't think during his commission, we're likely to see a Bitcoin, a spot yeah. Bitcoin product. Well, that's a good market. point. But, but what, what about her point? I mean, we, they've got this elsewhere. It seems to be working even if the market's collapsing. Is there less regulation in Canada, more regulation? I mean, well, the I, I think there's, there's two points that I'd make. First, it, FTX, a special situation. But remember, the exchange system as a whole for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is still not mature. You know, even if you don't have an FTX thing, there's still the issue of lack of segregation in any Bitcoin exchange in the event of bankruptcy. So there's still maturation that needs to happen there. The other thing that's really important is that the futures market itself has matured very quickly. So everybody wanted to talk about the roll costs when we launched BITO. You know what? They've come down 80 percent and they're converging right to the textbook solution, which is there, this is a financial future. 
It, you don't have to store oil in tankers, so therefore, the roll cost should equal short-term financing cost. By the way, Bitto holds cash to be quote unquote fully collateralized and therefore the roll cost offset by the earnings on the cash and we've been tracking spot Bitcoin very, very closely. So, you know, there's little downside to the futures contract. Right. Well, this is a very important point about this is the problem with owning futures contracts. When you roll into them, the commodities have storage costs. You get hit with that and it, you get decay over time holding the asset. But here there's nothing to store. There's no it's just an electronic ledger item, literally. So in and the theory, futures are cash settled. It, but is there actually a roll cost involved in this? There is, but what the what the textbook says is that the roll cost should be right around that short-term near risk-free lending rate. That's the no arbitrage condition. And Bitto is just a one. It's not a levered strategy, so you hold enough cash such that the return should be approximately spot Bitcoin, and therefore that roll cost is offset by the earnings on the cash. And that's what we've been seeing this year as Bitto has tracked spot Bitcoin very, very well. Yeah. Um, I want to distinguish, uh, people ask me what's going on with FTX. I want to distinguish here between the blockchain concept, which I am very personally think has tremendous future, reduces financial friction, smart contracts, decentralized finance. Uh, I think have tremendous potential as a financial disruptor, as a technological disruptor, and what's going on here. There's really two other things going on. One is, what's the value of cryptocurrencies in general, which obviously, you, you know, does, don't have intrinsic value, so go up and down dramatically. But the other is what's going on with FTX, which may or may not involve fraudulent activity. We don't know. But so there's a very specific situation going on here that's confusing everybody. I, would you agree with the idea, though, that this is definitely a ding on cryptocurrencies, but not doesn't 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 destroy the viability of the blockchain concept. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, we're in the early stages. You know, th there's clearly going to be a period of maturation. But to your point, blockchain and DeFi is is absolutely here to stay. And Bitcoin, for it, it's a, it's either a feature or a bug, depending on your point of view, is the pure play. It doesn't have utility on the blockchain, but it's a store of value. And look, if you want to have the sort of extreme view of things, uh, there's no gold standard for the dollar either anymore. So. Yeah. Well, yes. However, I would like to back the full faith and credit of the United States over the full faith and credit of Bitcoin, of which there is none as far as I'm, I'm aware, other than a, a, a belief system around it. Deborah, uh, I'm wondering how this might affect uh, crypto ETF flows. Uh, this is your data. At the end of October, 162 products listed globally, seven and a half billion. This is crypto products. Um, is, are we going to see that change, or does that does this change? This? I think people are concerned, but I think you're right. We have to differentiate crypto products from the blockchain and smart contracts because we are seeing that being used for many things, including tokenizing private equity and allowing retail access. Right. There's a project in Europe where creations and redemptions for ETFs are being done by ETP link using smart contracts, where before they were being used using emails. So I think there are definitely applications and the technology is very different than crypto. Yeah. I want to go back to your point earlier about the fact that there are Bitcoin ETFs elsewhere. There's in Canada, for example. Yeah. How are the authorities handling it there? I mean, Gensler says, I need more control over exchanges. I have no regulatory authority. What is the status of the regulatory system there? So basically, they went to the regulator in Canada and said the ETF wrapper is better than other ways of allowing investors to have access. And the regulator bought into that idea. And just like in fixed income, the crypto ETPs or ETFs in Canada have worked as well as they would if they were. And they're regulated by yes. the, the, the Canadian, Canadian authorities. Yes. And presumably, um, they, the, they're regulated, so they. They operate under a set of uh, rules and regulations, obviously. Similar to 40 Act funds here. There's yeah. a set of regulations in Canada. They've been, Canada actually has had ETFs for 33 years. We've had it here for 30. Yeah. So Canada. So is there some argument that could be made? I'm just trying to flip this on its head and say, well, look, it is operating over there. Nobody's going to necessarily protect anyone from price declines. I think the problem here that Gensler is afraid of, which makes sense, is if this thing collapses, if Bitcoin goes to $1,000 or $500, five years from now, somebody's going to haul 
those people in front of Congress saying, did you approve Bitcoin for grandma? Because this is essentially making it available to the masses. And whether or not it's tested as a real asset class, or should that be the standard? I don't know. And I, I think it's interesting you point out, Canadians are working on this. They do, they're doing it. I think the challenge is normally regulations in the U.S. are about disclosure, right? So you tell what type of disclosure needs to be available, and then people decide if they're going to invest, right? right. And that's the whole thing with FINRA, talking about complex products. What is a complex product? Well, I think with respect to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, you know, what happens if, if Bitcoin goes to 1,000? The issue isn't so much that we have disclosure rules. People can lose money, and we have the ITI. You could take the short side. The question is... Would that, what stress would that put on the exchanges if you were invested in the stock market, excuse me, in the Bitcoin exchange itself? And look, the money's coming out of the exchanges right now. People are worried about the commingling of assets, and they're going back to these cold wallets where I have my flash drive. But the ETF fixes a lot of that, particularly when it's belt and suspenders with the futures market. Yeah.